Thank you and welcome to CPA Australia's webinar, Ethics Issues for Professional Accountants in Business. My name is Belinda Zora McConnell and I'm a Regulatory Compliance Specialist at CPA Australia. We have people joining us from all over the country for today's webinar. So I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners of, from around Australia and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I extend this acknowledgement to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be joining us today. And as I am in New Zealand, kia ora koutou katoa. It's now my pleasure to introduce Andrew de Alvis, Jeff Kwan and Sharon Ditchburn. Andrew de Alvis is a highly respected speaker and lecturer in Australia and the United Arab Emirates with extensive commercial experience, particularly in information and business technology. Before this, she worked in financial systems management. Andrew is a high performance senior ex uh, corporate executive with international exposure to global markets and is very well connected to the financial business world. Andrew has held executive SEMA committee position as chairperson of the Queensland branch of SEMA and as a SEMA board member for the Misana region. Andrew currently holds the following key leadership positions. With SEMA UK, she's a global council member and a member of the Thought Leadership and Business Ethics Committee. With CPA Australia, she's a member of the Ethics and Professional Standards Centre of Excellence. Jeff Kwan is a director at IESBA. Jeff currently leads the development of IESBA's strategy and work plan for 2024 to 27. IESBA's consultative advisor group and he oversees IESBA's consultative advisory group and national standard setter liaison group meetings. He also conducts stakeholder outreaches globally to promote I the IESBA code. In his previous roles with IESBA, Jeff has managed a number of IES IESBA's technical projects, including inducement, role and mindset expected of professional accountants, and the definitions of listed entity and public interest entity. Jeff began his career as a solicitor before taking a number of technical and management roles in the banking industry and public sector in Australia. He holds a double degree in law and commerce from the University of Melbourne. And Sharon Ditchburn is a managing director of Capital Advantage Consultants based in Dubai for the past 19 years and covering the Middle East, Africa and Asia. She's a fellow of CPA Australia and the Governance Institute of Australia and has been on the Dubai Committee for CPA Australia for over 10 years and is currently on the ESG Centre of Excellence Committee for CPA Australia. Sharon is a licensed individual in the roles of finance, compliance, risk and anti-money laundering with a number of financial services companies in the Middle East. She was recently appointed to the IFAC PAIB advisory group representing CPA Australia and CAMS. I would also like to acknowledge that today we are joined by the CPA Australia Board Director, Anthony Wright, who's joining us from Perth. So thank you for joining us, Anthony. Today, we will also be taking questions through the Q&A box. So please direct those questions to all panelists and we will address your questions at the conclusion, depending upon the time remaining. However, if you have any trouble shooting queries, please message the host through the chat box. Now to get everybody thinking, just as we start, we're going to start with a Slido to generate some thoughts. So please make sure you do have this Slido open and hopefully you will see the first question is, what are some of the ethics issues faced by professional accountants in business? If you'd like to just add something there. I understand it takes a little while to pop up. You can see things popping up now already. We have independence, conflict, fraud, or conflict of interest. Yes, it's coming up quite loud and clear. Pressure from management. KPIs over compliance. Yes, absolutely. I'll just give it a few more moments. Certainly seems conflict and conflict of interest uh, is coming up strongly. Personal interest, I guess that's where much of the conflict might come from. Independence, of course. 
That's great. What else do we have? Broad familiarity, compliance, whistleblower versus betrayal. Yes, we'll be touching on this. I think Sharon will be touching on some of these aspects. Thank you, everybody. I really do appreciate that. I think that will help generate some conversation as we go along. Right, now I'm going to hand over to Jeff, who is going to uh, set the scene for us uh, regarding IASBIS work in the areas of greenwashing, financial presentation, and NOCLA, and in particular, what PAIBs should be alert to. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Belinda. And thank you, everyone, um, for attending this uh, session today. And thank you for CPA of Australia for uh, inviting uh, me um, to, uh, I guess, uh, speak to to you on some of the ethical considerations uh, on sustainability reporting. Uh, it will cover some of the areas that um, are covered by our code. So hopefully, um, you know, it will be some useful information for you, but but more so uh, given the you know, we only have 10 minutes uh, for me. So uh, hopefully at least it will just generate some thinking for you if you are involved in sustainability reporting uh, any way, shape or form. Um, I guess just to set the scene, sustainability reporting, um, you know, accountants and professional accountants like yourselves do play a very significant role uh, when it comes to financial and non-financial information reporting. And, you know, you, you play a very important part in, in the whole ecosystem when it comes to sustainability reporting uh, and assurance. Um, and, you, you know, I, I think uh, because of the uh, significant interest in sustainability reporting uh, by the public and by investors, I, I think there is a, a, a new focus on preparers uh, of information. And, you know, as, as we've seen, you know, when it comes to sustainability reporting, it may be new to some of you, some of you may be doing it for a while, and certainly in the regulatory uh, uh, communities and in the standard setting communities, we really kind of start to move very quickly. Uh, certainly in the, in the global standard setting uh, uh, environment, um, you know, we are moving very quickly. Of course, you have the ISSB on sustainability disclosure, uh, and then we have our sister board, IWSB, the International Auditing Assurance Standards Board, working on an independent assurance standard. Uh, and for us in IASPA, we are working on, on the ethical behavior, on the ethics standards, and also the independent standard. Uh, so things are, are moving very quickly in this space. Um, and I guess one of the key issues that um, you know, everyone has identified when it comes to sustainability uh, report, in particular at this stage in the absence of one single set of global standards that people can use, uh, is the issue of, of greenwashing. And I just want to touch on it a little bit and how the code deals with it in the next um, few minutes. Um, greenwashing, it is not a term that is defined in our code. Um, but uh, something from IOSCO uh, in one of the reports, uh, I think gave a really good explanation of what, uh, what we are referring to when we talk about greenwashing. Uh, refers to practices that involve misleading intended users of the information or intentionally giving them a false impression about how well an organization or an investment is aligned with these sustainability goals. Uh, and in that report, they also have a bunch of examples as well. Uh, and one of them is the overemphasis of uh, ESG in corporate information, uh, where such considerations have had very little or limited impact on the actual investment or business strategy uh, implemented. And I, I think at this point, I just want to, uh, I guess, uh, encourage you and and uh and highlighting the, the the importance of of trust in financial information as as we have all experienced in in the last uh, a few years, there's a lot of uh, the, the public failures of some of the high profile uh, organizations around the world uh, has really damaged uh, public trust in, in financial reporting and in information disclosure, including, you know, sustainability. And, and, and I think 
that's why it's so important for for preparers uh, to adhere to a high uh, uh, standard of ethical behavior, such as those that are required uh, from the from the IASPA code, because I, without ethics, without ethical behavior, you cannot really create trust in the work that you do and create trust in the reports that, that you uh, present for you know, whatever reasons. Um, so when it comes to the IASPA code, um, it is a building block approach. Some of you may be familiar with our code and some of you might not, but essentially it is a building block uh, approach. Um, it has the five fundamental principles, which is listed out here, integrity, objectivity, professional competence, due care, confidentiality and professional behavior. Uh, and we also have a conceptual framework and, and giving uh, prof uh, accountants the guidance of how to deal with uh, threats to comply with these fundamental principles. Uh, and then uh, and then they'll have different standards or provisions that deal with different ethical issues. And I've highlighted here in, in the circles on the right-hand side, uh, some of the provisions in our code or sections in our code that helps uh, prepare us dealing with uh, so, uh, when it comes to sustainability information. Um, there's a few here, for instance, needing to have an inquiring mind, uh, conflicts of interest that we've seen from some of the questions uh, from the slide of just then, uh, creating a, or, you know, the right ethical organizational culture. Uh, but in the next uh, few minutes, um, I just want to focus on three um, aspects or three uh, ethical issues when it comes to uh, dealing with greenwashing. Um, now, I can only be brief here uh, this afternoon, but I want to encourage you to, to uh, jump onto our website when you have a chance. Uh, we have a dedicated sustainability uh, uh, focus area and web page, and we have a whole series of, of information and, and presentations that, that you could perhaps uh, look at. Uh, but we have recently uh, released a, a staff publication called Ethical Considerations in Sustainability Reporting, and the main focus is to help uh, professional accountants like yourself how to navigate uh, your way through preparation of sustainability information uh, and dealing with greenwashing. So I would encourage you to, to go and check that out. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is preparing and presenting information, and that's in section 220 uh, of, of our code. Um, um, you know, in our code in section 220, it talks about how a professional uh, accountant can prepare and present information ethically. Uh, for instance, it, it talks about it needs to be in accordance with uh, relevant reporting framework. And, and this section is not just limited to financial information, it includes non-financial information uh, as well. Uh, it, it talks about that it needs to be uh, in a manner that uh, not to as not to mislead or it cannot omit information with the intention to to making the information misleading. Uh, it talks about that we need to avoid undue influence and and be aware of of bias. Uh, another key element of this section that I really want to draw your attention to is the need to exercise professional judgment. Uh, as certainly as professional accountants, I, I believe is one of the greatest assets professional accountants uh, can provide is your ability uh, to exercise professional judgment and to think uh, critically. Uh, and, and so this section talks about the need to exercise professional judgment in different situations. Um, another key element uh, I also want to draw your attention to is when you rely on the work of others and certainly when it comes to sustainability reporting uh, you know it is a huge issue uh, because often the information is so complex and sometimes it's not something that you've come across uh, with and so you need to rely on the work of external experts uh, and so this section talks about how you should rely on the work of others uh, and also not just the work of a human person you know today uh, we we are more and more using relying on technology and the output of technology uh, and, and certainly one of our, our um, projects at the moment, uh, our technology project is looking at how to uh, enhance this section to, to uh, in, expand on, on how you can rely on outputs of technology. Uh, and, and this section talks about taking the appropriate um, action. Um, 
Another ethical issue I think I've heard from the Slido as well is dealing with pressure. And now Cole certainly talks a lot about how to deal with pressure. Um, well, right now, like me, I'm under pressure to try and finish in one minute, so I'm going to do my best. Um, but, um, uh, you know, our code talks about um, having the uh, complying with the fundamental principle of integrity. And, and one of the elements of having integrity is to having the strength of character to act appropriately, even when facing pressure. Uh, because as professional accountants, we have a responsibility to act in the public interest. And and that means that even sometimes when things are not going your way and it might affect you uh, financially, you still have a responsibility to act in the public interest, to act with integrity. Uh, and in our code, section 220 specifically talks about dealing with pressure uh, to uh, to breach the fundamental principles. So I encourage you to, to have a look at that. Uh, and then finally, um, I am already at my 10 minutes. I'm going to spend one minute talking about NOCLA. Um, and uh, maybe at the end, if there's question time left, I can talk a little bit more. Uh, but essentially, it's in section 260 of our code for those who are professional accountants in business. Um, the important thing to, to think about NOCLA is essentially the overarching reason why we have this provision uh, is the Profession, the profession's responsibility to, to act in the public uh, interest. Um, and when you look at the provisions, it, it has three distinctive um, elements, I would say. Uh, number one is you need to understand the matter, uh, meaning that you need to understand what the issues are, uh, what the non-compliance might be or suspect, suspected non-compliance. Uh, and the other uh, element is that you need to uh, uh, um, report to the appropriate level of management, and that could be those charged with governance, to make sure and give them the opportunity to to uh, to take actions. Um, and the last element is to determine whether you need to take any further uh, actions. Um, now, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to stop here, but those are the three main elements when it comes to uh, our NOCLA uh, provisions, and they are responsibility uh, for all professional accountants. Uh, there's also responsibilities mainly for senior professional accountants and also responsibilities for those who are not in senior roles, um, uh, maybe less stringent. Um, so I'm going to stop there uh, because I've run out of time um, and I'm just going to move to the next page. Um, and um, I'm going to, I guess, invite Andrew to, to take the next uh, sec section. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. I hope everyone can hear me. And uh, my name is Andrew Dialwes, and it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you, CPA Australia, for inviting me to talk to uh, the audience about this important topic. And um, it's amazing to see so many people joining our session today. And I guess uh, the topic is really interesting to a lot of people. So great to have you guys here now what is the cost of being green um well jeff spoke a lot about the assurance that we as finance professionals provide to the public and uh, well shouldn't we when we report um any type of numbers in both financial non-financial numbers and information for that matter, we need to provide that assurance to the public. Now, if you look at a little b, that provides enormous amount of um, contribution to nature and to us. And if you look at what's happened to this b, um, well, it contributes 500 billion a year to global food production. Now this can all go away and it can definitely impact us, you and me, if we don't provide that assurance to the public. And also, um, you know, we, we see so many companies um, in this space impacting the environment. So it is really important for us as uh, keepers of this information, provide the right information to the public. 
Now let's go a little bit into uh, our our trust. Well, we talk about trust and for sustainability, we need to have that trust. We invest in stock market because we trust the information that is there. Well, if you look at the information, who is providing the information? It is the accounting professionals who provide that information. Therefore, there is a lot of trust there. Similarly, when it comes to um, our information about other areas, anything else that we provide, and in this case, but particularly related to sustainability, we need to have that trust. And in that slide, or uh, I think question, it was really prominent. Uh, you know, there were key areas that came about, like conflict of interest, pressure. Um, I think those are really, really important things to consider when you're providing the information. Something else that Jeff mentioned was that we have not only the people who provide the information, but also technology is there to pro they are as enablers to provide information. Now, my area of focus is very much on technology and who crafts and creates this technology. It is people. It is and we as accountants need to have a seat at the table, especially when it comes to the architecture of this, this technology that we are going to, that, that's going to be the enabler to providing this information. And this is where my thoughts are when it comes to this particular topic, sustainability. Now, let's go to uh, some other areas. If you look at this beautiful view, what is the price of a great sea view? And if you look at this amazing forest, the greenery, what is the view? And how can you track it and invoice it? This is where this carbon credits come as well. And is it correct that we, you know, how do we track this? How do we invoice it? This is where we talk about can this technology be ethical, right? This technology is required because it provides, it helps us provide this information. However, you and I both know there have been many a time where technologies have been manipulated as well, right? The underlying technology has been manipulated. So I think it is essential that we be part of that architecture when it comes to designing this technology, right? Whether it be what sort of technology are we talking about? Can we talk about something like a distributed ledger? And that could be either blockchain or Hedera. And what should we choose? How green is your technology? We know today that there are um, electric cars, but there are questions related to how green is your electric car. Similarly, it's important to consider how green is the technology that you're using to provide this information and also looking at, well, can this technology be changed, manipulated? So the ethics play a significant role here when it comes to from design, the choosing of the technology, as well as how do you structure the information, etc. I think with that, I'm going to hand over to Sharon. Thank you, Sharon. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Angie. Um, so I'm taking up a uh, a slightly different slant, I'll be looking at the ecosystem that the accountant uh, is often sitting in, either in a, a large firm or a small firm. And, and of course, this can change quite significantly depending on your level of seniority, 
It can depend on how big your financial team is. And then of course, how big the company is as well. So we wanted to just consider where does the accountant sit when it comes to other offices uh, that could be including from the board. It could be if you've got other independent departments sitting there as compliance, internal audit, risk, um, anti-money laundering, perhaps also quality and some of these other ones as well. And often, um, and as we saw with Slido, a lot of people have got various concerns about conflicts of interest, pressure from management, et cetera. And it's quite an interesting thing because when we look at our ecosystem, we're looking at it in both terms of people and we're also looking at it in terms of documents, so processes and policies and, and things like this. Now, we know from practice is that as uh, professional accountants and we have the IESBA code, some, but not all of the other professionals that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis may have a similar code. Some may have no codes at all. So it, it could actually depend on whether or not they're, they're part of a professional organization on a personal level, or in some cases you'll see, like in the financial services industry, uh, the regulator will try to impose uh, at least a minimum code on most of the senior people and of course on the organization itself. But we can still see quite a large gap. Now, some of the ways where we see there is some support uh, for us as accountants is that um, there's a duty of care for directors. There could be a good practice requirements within business. There could be marketing requirements. And as we've seen with Jeff, we're starting to see where there's there's active guidance in areas such as greenwashing, et cetera. But when we sit down and look at it, what are some of the true challenges that we face as accountants um, when it comes to applying our ethical standards in a situation where someone else does not exercise the same level of ethical standards? And so we can often see, number one, the accountant themselves may not be a prime decision maker, unless they're maybe a, a chief financial officer. Um, often we are just one of the people that are involved in a process or we're one of many on a committee. And so as an accountant, we can see that there are ethical issues there. We often can't make the decision. And so what we need to do is we need to have a look at how we can influence the decision, how we can persuade and in very rare cases, can you probably point to a, a law or a code and say, look, this is where the line is. Um, and it actually matches the same as our ethics. We often see our ethical standards are going to be much higher than what a code or a rule or a law will require in terms of our day-to-day uh, -day operations. And so um, we, we see other issues sometimes arise. So uh, we saw an example, there was pressure from management. Um, we can see from fraud statistics that come from organizations like the ACFE, that often um, we will see professional accountants faced with an issue and then they have their own personal conflicts such as, are they getting well paid? Are there, are there some excuses where they say, well, look, you know, uh, somebody else is actually making the, mis the decision. What can I do? Um, in certain cases, I can see even where well-intentioned professionals say, well, look, if I leave, then someone else will come in and they won't know where the skeletons are in the closet. Um, or if I leave um, while I'm here, I'm protecting the client. So I'm trying to reduce the actual impact. And we know this is not the correct way to go. We know that ethically, we need to actually apply the highest standard at all times. So what do we actually look at? Like when does a dilemma actually become a compromise? And this is often the, the issue that we're faced. We can see a dilemma. We can see a conflict of interest. We can refer to our IESBA code. We can refer to specific guidelines like Jeff was talking about the greenwashing. But at the end of the day, we have to go back to the office and we need to talk to the management. We need to talk to our fellow associates. We need to talk to other people in the organization. 
And that's our first port of call is obviously to try and influence the decision making in a way which is more ethical. Sometimes this is not going to work when we are the sole voice in the wilderness. And so our next step then, of course, is to then draw the support of some of the other uh, parties that are in the, the organization. And so your compliance officer, if you're in a big firm, you, it's more likely these days you will have a risk and a compliance function as well. So these are going to be, again, the people that you can draw support on. Um, oh, I think people are asking for slides. We're not doing slides for this particular section. So just so you know, yeah. And um, so we can look at compliance. Uh, another source that I found a lot of support from as well is that as practicing accountants, I would often go and talk to the internal auditor. And as we know, the internal auditor is not the, the policeman that sits in the background. Our internal audit function and to some extent also our external audit function, external audit are not there as frequently as internal audit. So you'll find if you want to do something a bit more immediate, you've got some other sources like internal audit. Now we know the auditors have got the same ethical standards that we're required, but if you're going back to like a, a compliance and risk person, again, you might be faced with somebody who's got a slightly different ethical standard However, they're more likely to have a regulatory obligation as well. And so what we look at as accountants is how do we how do we combine our ethical requirements with some of these other regulatory areas as well? Now, um, one of the issues here, of course, is that drawing the support of some of these independent decision makers, again, they may not be part of the operational team. So we can build support through these independent parties, but still again, at the end of the day, we have to go back to management and management are the ones that are making the decisions or the operations teams are making the decisions. The other issue too, is that you may not be working for a big company. You might be in an SME. They're not going to have all of these additional departments. And so what can we do as accountants? So, um, and I think it's particularly interesting in today's time because we're going to have to have extra vigilance now where in times of economic stress, after we've had natural disasters, we've had COVID, we're now facing inflation and for some of you hyperinflation, um, there's, there's extra competitors in the market. And so we're going to continue to see a lot of fraud. We're going to see a, a lot of uh, non-compliance issues. And so as accountants, this is, this is something that's never going to go away. Who else can we actually get support from? Well, um, we also look to the board and if you do have a, a channel into the board, or if you do have a channel into that ownership or governance structure, uh, there may be somebody there who is uh, a good person to talk to. But again, most accountants are, are, do not have this capacity. So we're then faced with channels which become a little bit more formal. And so whistleblowing is definitely one of those. And we've seen, um, we've seen in recent years that governments have actually changed a lot of the whistleblowing laws, uh, both in order to protect whistleblowers, but also to recognize the fact that whistleblowing is not um, say whistleblowing sometimes has a negative context. So you sometimes see it's even being called speaking up. And so they want to see an encouragement there. And, um, and in some ways, if you don't have a formal whistleblowing uh, policy inside your company, it's certainly time to put something in place. But of course your whistleblowing, again, needs to be able to go somewhere. So whether or not that goes to audit or whether that goes to the board, that is also going to be, again, an operational uh, business decision for, for the governing body. And um, it's interesting because we do see in certain situations, uh, there are particular ways to report certain types of concerns. So we will often see a separation between whether it is a criminal concern. So something like money laundering in particular has a very specific 
uh, channel that it must be reported to. You, you must report it to money laundering offices. They will report it to the central bank of your, your um, particular country. Fraud. Uh, companies will obviously want to know about these before it goes to the police. You'll often see uh, these sorts of issues. Companies will want to investigate. Um, however, at the end of the day, the accountant often has to sit there and decide, do I go to one of these outside regulatory bodies? So do I go to a police? Do I go to a financial services regulator? Do I go to some other organization? And of course, now we also see anti-corruption organizations and committees and panels being set up across a range of different countries as well. Now that's a somewhat serious area. So before we do that, the accountant themselves may also be considering, well, I'm not really quite sure what to do. What would be appropriate in this time? Uh, you know, is this something where I really need to, to go nuclear straight away? Or is there something else which is more just of a concern that leads to a reputational risk? It could lead to a conflict of interest risk. Uh, it could lead to something which is not, not a criminal risk, nothing that's that serious, but there could be some other elements like, you know, there could be other non-financial matters that you've seen as well. Now, in this case, I would like to also uh, remind people that your professional body also has a range of different channels that can be used. Uh, and so, for example, we see the general discussion digest. I see that actively quite uh, actively used and there's some very interesting elements on there as well. So that's that's an open system where we can see questions being posed by uh, members of, of the societies. You may also have some local industry committees. You can get some advice, um, your own informal networks. And for some of you, if you're really challenged with ethical questions, I would consider finding yourself a mentor. Find yourself someone who is outside the business, but maybe has an understanding of what goes on. Um, maybe not your particular business, but definitely within the industry. Um, but again, you would need to be very careful with confidentiality. So again, a lot of our channels, they are there. Some of them are formalized and set up, but we must always, again, we're faced with yet another small conflict, how confidential we also need to be. To so have general concerns, definitely have a talk to your, your local uh, network group or, or talk to your mentor. So I just think that um, if in any doubt, please go back to the IASBO codes. They're, they're very comprehensive. Um, there's some really good practical examples. Uh, the one, the greenwashing one in particular that just came out last week that Jeff was talking about. Uh, looking at that, that's got very good questions that we face. So I think it's just important to remember that as accountants, society actually thinks that we have a good reputation. They, society looks at accountants as being the good guys. All right. So it shouldn't be surprising to anyone that we try to maintain a good ethical standard. But you know at the same time that we also have our own dilemmas and how to deal with them. So I think at the end of the day, it comes down to being brave. It comes down to developing your own appropriate resources as a support network. Don't wait until you're in the issue. Actually look around now and say, if I had a particular type of problem, how would I approach this? Do I have a formal channel? Do I have informal channels? Is there a regulatory requirement? Uh, or is this something where I, I have a concern, but we're not at a level of non-compliance? There's no risk to health, safety, or legal reputation. We have to determine sometimes drastic measures are required and yet other times that soft approach and the, the persuasion that's actually um, that should really be our first port of call if it's appropriate. So I'd like to stop here. Uh, I'm going to hand back to Belinda. Thank you very much Sharon um, and thank you Jeff and Andrew for those presentations. Uh, now 
everybody, I'd, really, I'd like to invite you to uh, put any questions you have um, for the presenters into the chat, and we can uh, pick their brains on their on their uh, respective topics or anything else that falls under the heading of um, current ethical issues for professional accountants in business. Um, I have one question actually for Sharon, if I may, if I may kick it off. Um, as we acknowledged in the Slido at the beginning, conflicts of interest came up uh, quite large, and you touched on conflicts of interest as well. I was wondering, and, and you touched us at the very end there on soft methodologies, and mm -hmm. and in ways in which often the accountant in business is not necessarily the decision maker, and is not necessarily able to affect uh, something like a whistleblowing system, for for example. But what are some of the other ways that the uh, the accountant in the business could influence the culture itself? Yeah, yeah, and I think culture is an interesting one. There have been quite a few culture projects that have been conducted around the world, uh, some of them at board level, some of them at management level, and then some of them general. And I think, you know, Jeff would also have some fantastic information about some of these. Um, what they find, of course, is that a lot of the issues um, arise because of silos. So the person, people within certain silos will know about certain things which are happening. And other people in other silos and particularly if they're supposed to be the, the reviewers. So if you know that internal audit uh, hasn't come and audited you maybe for a year um, because you're considered low risk, there still could be something happening there. So on the culture side, um, I think most accountants are actually pretty good at preempting a lot of issues that could arise. So we preempt things by having uh, good budgets, by having good procurement systems, you know, accountants, we, we love policies and procedure. So we're usually quite good at following this. Um, not everybody else likes policy and procedure, as we know in, in companies. So um, some of the ways that we can do it, obviously, if we can um, use technology as much as possible to take out the human uh, decision making, that's certainly one way of doing it. Um, Oftentimes I find as an accountant, I point out to people that it, this is not just about making a quick win or giving somebody a special benefit. At the end of the day, um, if something is a conflict of interest, so it's a third party, trans, uh, sorry, a related party transaction, for example, I as an accountant am obliged to report this in my notes to my financial disclosures. Um, or if there's something to do with the compliance issue, we will be obliged to report to a certain third party, you know, particularly regulators. So sometimes um, just by reminding the decision makers that there's a consequence to their actions, that is really, I'm not doing it as, as a personal issue, I'm doing it because it's actually part of a law um, or because there's a recognized risk with maybe a, a contracting party. Um, that that is that they're making that decision to proceed on the basis that I've said, look, you are actually now taking a significant risk. Uh, and so it I, I think you know they they are never surprised when the accountant brings up the fact that there are certain risks that they take. I think um, there's a recognition that we are actually one of the the better people in organizations to recognize risk and also that we're generally not afraid to bring it up. Uh, it's just that you then face with that issue is that you could get overridden or they could say, thank you very much, uh, and then still make the decision anyway. Then, of course, that puts us in the decision. Do we then have a further obligation to do something after that? Yes, yes. And that actually brings me to something, Jeff, that you said. You touched on NOCLA toward the end of your presentation. And so my impression is that that would then Put a following on what Sharon's saying would put the accountable firmly in the um, or potentially in the no class space. Would that be right? Uh, yes. Um, if if I could just quickly go back to in terms of firstly the general culture aspect, um, we do think certainly from the code that professional accountants because of you know, the profession has a responsibility to act in the public interest because of the role in terms of the interaction of data uh, and information. They do play a really important role in terms of maintaining the proper functional 
functioning of capital markets. Um, so culture is really important. Um, and we expect professional accountants to really try and create the right culture. But as we all know, you know, we all work in organizations and, and with people one way or another, we know that culture usually sets from the top. And so if you're in a senior role, it's really important, you know, we talk about the tone from the top and it's really important that the more senior you are, the more opportunities you have in setting the culture and the co and recognizes uh, this. Uh, in terms of conflicts of interest, um, uh, you know, the code, uh, as you might know, also talks about that and we, it particularly talks about you should not let conflicts of interest compromise uh, the exercise of your professional judgment or, or business judgment. And some of the more principles, it talks about making sure that you make the right disclosure, getting consent, uh, and, 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 you know, there's a couple of other things. Uh, but in terms of, of, of NOCLA, um, it, it, it does uh, create, you know, it is a high bar that we're trying to set for professional accountants. Uh, and as Sharon have mentioned, um, you know, it is not something that, uh, you know, a lot of other professions have to uh, deal with, uh, you know, jurisdictions have their, you know, whistleblower uh, regulations or, or laws to, to comply with, uh, but no client is something on top of that sometimes. Uh, and particularly in jurisdictions that they might not have, you know, very comprehensive whistleblower uh, requirements. Uh, so what is what this is is about NOCLA is basically it, it started with uh, uh, asking the question about whether auditors should just uh, sit there and just say, uh, 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 um, you know, resign for the service or disassociate themselves from the service. And the rationale is, no, no, we believe professional accountants need to do more. They need to take proactive action uh, more than just, oh, you know, hang on, we can't do this audit. Uh, you know, they need to do more. There is an element that in the public interest that more needs to be, uh, no, more needs to be done. And that's how sort of the whole NOCLA uh, provisions uh, uh, started. Uh, um, so, uh, you know, that's why when I was talking about earlier, it, there's an element that we expect professional accountants to understand what the issue might be. And, and it can be quite challenging. Uh, let's be honest, we, we live in a very complex environment these days. Uh, I know Andrew's talking about the technology stuff earlier. It is very complex for anybody, uh, you know, let alone professional accountants who uh, may not have any sort of strong technology uh, background. Uh, uh, but nonetheless, uh, you know, it is important to understand the issues, understand the law and regulations and, and our no card provisions uh, even back then uh, recognize the importance of environmental protection laws. But of course, this is much more than that. Um, and to really uh, uh, then then the reporting element, and I think Sharon talks about that, is we're not expecting the professional accountants necessarily to be able to solve the problem. Uh, we've talked about, we've heard that, um, you know, from Sharon that, you know, often they're not necessarily the decision makers. Uh, but but there is a reporting element, you know, making sure that those have who does have the decision making authority can have the opportunity to make the right decision. Uh, and then the next step we're expecting the professional accountants to do is once that's done, if the if uh, if the no uh, the non compliance or the suspected non compliance is still there, uh, then the professional accountants need to think about well what other actions should I take. Um, you know, and, and the code certainly uh, has given some guidance um, on that, including disclosing to a relevant sort of authority, uh, and, and there are then additional guidance uh, on that. So I guess in, in short, I would say that, yeah, we do expect high ethical bar from professional accountants. And, and to Sharon's point is because there is an expectation from the public, uh, because accountants interaction with, with data and, and, you know, those in CFO roles, for instance, you know, you know, that we expect a lot um, to, to make sure, uh, you know, they are acting in the public interest. Thanks. Belinda. Thank you. I actually have a question for um, Andrew and, and Sharon. I think this is an intersection here regarding how the uh, accountant and business can interrogate those ethics, Andrew, that you mentioned that underpin the technology um, whose data we are now relying on and how, uh, because I understand that inherently there can be biases and various other sort of ethical concerns and ethical concerns within how that, um, how that technology has been, I suppose, I guess originally designed. Well, thank you, Belinda. I think that's a really important question because uh, there are various types of technologies that we use. And when we look at 
even AI, there's a lot of, there can be a lot of biases, right? So that's where the accountant can play a very strong role, thinking about the ethics, the data, and, and think about, you know, from where are we capturing this data? Because it's garbage in, garbage out, right? So it is important that we capture the correct data to begin with if you're trying to report something. And then we look at the biases that might be underlying. That is, that's the reason I said, you know, even when it comes to uh, designing the system, we need to get involved and ask the right questions from the technologists. It's not that we need to be technology suddenly and go in, down that road, but we can ask the right questions to reduce the risks and also provide that assurance because at the end of the day, we need to provide that assurance to the public. What we report is correct. Thank you. And I, I think to add to that, it's also interesting that the accountant is often um, the person that will detect unusual trends and issues and outcomes. And it's that um, I always say at the end of the day, fraud will always come out in the financial statements. It might take a little bit, but someone sooner or later uh, on the accounting department is going to look at something. And if they didn't even know about how this fraud or how these issues have arisen, it may not be fraud. It could just be inappropriate business. Uh, or that could be some other non-financial issue. Sooner or later, it's going to come out in numbers. And so, again, this is where the accountant's job is to actually be very pragmatic, uh, be inquiring. If you're seeing things which are unusual trends and numbers, it might be because either the technology um, has uh, an incorrect uh, programming, perhaps, or, or somewhere, somewhere along the, the system, people have been able to manipulate it or they've simply been able to put in the wrong information. And so I just think as accountants, we are we have to be very um, forward looking in terms of making sure that before anything else goes through our system is that we think it's logical and we think it makes sense and we think it's true and, and correct. And if there's any indicators there, that's when it should stop. And then that's when we should make some further inquiries. Great, thank you. I think that's all we've got time for um, but I do want to thank the three of you thank you Jeff uh, Sharon and Andrew for your um, for your presentation and sharing your expertise with us it certainly sounds like um, almost as if the responsibility said they count it never ends so it's nice to know that we don't need to actually be the technology experts I do appreciate that uh, but also um, thank you for um, helping us have the confidence and empowering us to speak up when we do see that those numbers do look different or uh, we aren't getting the response we want and we need we know when we need to elevate our concerns so thank you everyone i'm going to hand back to amy now thank you and uh thank you everyone for your participation today in the next three working days you'll receive an evaluation survey accompanied by the recording of this webinar we really appreciate your feedback as it's extremely valuable to CPA Australia to help us deliver better events for you. Thanks again, and we look forward to welcoming you to another CPA webinar very soon.